Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel on leadership and narrators, which will look at the stories politicians tell when they're talking about the EU and the way they tell them. My name is Duncan Robinson. I'm the Brussels Bureau Chief at The Economist uh, here in Belgium. And we have a panel of people who have helped shape those narratives and indeed shape those leaders. Um, but before we get to those, uh, we're going to first hear a few words from Reni Kupuas, who's the Senior Research Associate here at the Klingendahl Institute. Rene, do you want to take it away? Thank you very much, uh, Duncan. Dear participants of this great Klingendahl conference, this panel is about leadership, about European leadership. But how do we define European leadership? That's not so crystal clear. Do we mean leadership by European institutions? Or do we mean leadership by European personalities? Do we mean leadership by the European heads of state, especially the big ones, the Franco-German axis? Or is European leadership executed by the ECB or the financial markets? We can differentiate between three types of leadership, technocratic leadership, populist leadership, and democratic leadership. And in a way, we just said goodbye to the embodiment of European leadership. And that was Bundeskanzler Angela Merkel, the Muti of Europe. She was an example of European democratic leadership. What made her so special is that she upheld her doctrine of Zusammenhalt, of keeping Europe together in the midst of serious crisis. She was the Krisenkanzler who did not deepen the European divides by confrontation, but reconcile different interests and political tra traditions, respecting smaller and bigger member states. Merkel was both a nationally respected leader and a European leader. Of course, we, one could criticize her so-called lack of visionary politics or the Merkel method of strategic patience. But I think we will miss her dearly just at the moment that more European leadership is asked for. A lot depends on the way this European leadership will be executed or by, or by whom. I do believe in the course towards, the, towards European strategic autonomy, unless the, this concept is more directed towards, towards our ally, the United States, than against our authoritarian systemic rivals, China and Russia. I do believe in the notion that in the geopolitical world West world we are living in today, the EU should be much stronger, less divided, slow and technocratic, and gets its act together in foreign policy and security politics. We need convincing European leaders for that task because our continent, especially the younger millennial generations, have a pacifist threat perception. They feel threatened by the climate crisis, but only by the climate crisis. And for that, you do not need an army, nor drones, nor nuclear deterrence. What we need are European leaders that can renew the self-confidence and pride of Europe. And then I'm referring to the notion that liberal democracies are the best guarantee for future prosperity, welfare, and technological innovation. In this Chinese century, given the authoritarian challenge, the notion of guaranteed future success for liberal democracies is contested. Code word, decline of the West. Europe is still a quality of life superpower of the world, a middle-class paradise. Europe in some is a creative welfare democracy based on egalitarian social market economies, the rule of law, freedom of speech and media. But it's always under pressure both from the inside and from the outside. But what we need are European leaders to make the European model world competitive again, especially in technological innovation, and to defend European values and interests against external threats. However, what is undermining European leadership is the complex, multi-layered structure of the European Union. Many people in the streets have never heard about the State of the Union of Ursula von der Leyen, or never heard about Charles Michel. For them, Spitzenkandidaten do not ring any bell. Let's be realistic. Brussels watching is a minority sport in all our member states. People see Angela Merkel or President, President Macron 
as the European leaders to have to balance national and European interests and function under democratic and media control. What is undermining European leadership, in my view, is that in Brussels, there's only one narrative. More Europe, more integration, more centralization as a tiny answer to all problems while bashing the member states. Despite all the divides in Europe, despite the populist revolt all over the place, despite the fragmentation of the post-war political systems in nearly all our member states, which seriously weaken the domestic mandate for national politicians, look at Germany, the greedy European institutions have not become more modest, selective or careful. On the contrary, full speed ahead in all directions and in all dimensions. There's more deepening, more integration and more enlargement, more EU all over the place, all at the same time. This, that constitutes a big risk for national and European leadership. It might be a big gamble with large, large parts of the European population who are not involved in European politics whatsoever. The EU as a de facto post-democratic elite project should be modest and very selective. There is a danger that further European centralization will deepen the divides and cleavages in Europe and will produce the forces of national populism that the European Union was meant to overcome. Some measures could provoke populism in Southern Europe. Other measures could provoke national populist backlashes in Northern Europe. Look at the fragile political situation in France, where establishment and counter-establishment are nearly in balance. I conclude, even more than national politics, European politics is a balancing act. I have difficulties with Europe's carelessness, with the careless way in which Europe is dealt with. National populists are tearing the EU apart with their anti-EU stories as if there were no history. Technocratic Euro-federalists are tearing nation states and national democracies apart as if there were no history. What we need are European leaders with a strong sensibility for both national democracy and European politics and who have the courage to stand up against both populism and technocracy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for those very interesting comments. Now we're going to start the conversation. Uh, sorry, before we move on to that, a little bit of housekeeping. There is a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So throughout this entire, entire chat, please fire any questions that you think of at any moment and I will uh, get to them at some point. But before we begin that session, we're going to start with Saar van Buren, who is the political advisor of the Party of European Socialists. And before that was a political advisor for Franz Timmermans, uh, where she worked on his Spitzenkandidaten campaign. And that's where I'd actually like to start. So that was quite a unique experiment in democracy. There was, you know, 450 million citizens across 27 countries speaking at least 24 languages. How on earth do you approach that from a communication point of view? How on earth do you get your political messages across such a diverse audience? You want mute? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, uh, with um, uh, a candidate uh, who speaks uh, seven languages uh, fluently, uh, that's uh, quite of a superficial um, answer, I think, because but not completely unimportant because it did mean that in a lot of countries not only his uh, own, own country, he could actually be on TV, uh, which many other uh, European politicians uh, can't. He could be in the live talk shows uh, in the evening with the uh, most viewers because he could be live on TV. He could uh, have a live presidential, presidential um, debate uh, or more of them with the other candidate in Germany, um, uh, in German. Um, so that helps. Uh, that's one aspect of it. Second of all, it's not only about him speaking those languages. Um, and again, so he could speak uh, in, in the Netherlands, Belgium, France, uh, Germany, Italy, Spain, 
and uh, bid in Poland, uh, he literally could speak the language of the people. Uh, but just using words in their language is not enough. You also need to understand who you're talking to. You understand the culture. Um, so Van Stimmermans in, in, in German is a bit of a different Van Stimmermans <coughs> than in Italian. In Germany, you, you speak uh, much more formal, uh, easy. You have a suit and a tie wherever you are. Uh, in Italy, you speak with passion. You always talk about uh, uh, football. You roll up your sleeves. Uh, also on, uh, on TV sh shows, TV debates, or on a stage with a lot of people. And he knows from all those countries, because he follows, I don't know where he finds the time, his team, we have uh, had quite a lot of people, but you don't have to tell him, like, this is happening in this country, this is happening in this, he knows already. So he could, in every country, also really engage with people on a level of music, culture, uh, pol uh, politics, uh, all of that. So uh, that's really when you talk about language and understanding the way you communicate with the people who you're talking to. Then I also believe in a way there, is, there isn't only 30 languages in, in Europe. There is something like one language. I mean, we are all Europeans. So, uh, technically, they speak a different language, but uh, we noticed traveling around Europe, there is a kind of common language. And of course, in every country, you have something specific at that time in the news or whatever. But uh, even that, people just, all people in Europe, whether it was a farmer in Poland or uh, a latte, what, uh, whatever drinking person in Helsinki, they just wanted to talk about fair distribution, uh, why is Google uh, not paying any tax and my little shop here isn't, I want minimum wage, um, I want a, a solution, European solution on, clim on climate. And in the end, we also discovered everybody wanted to talk about affordable housing. So there is also a, a common European language, no matter what language you speak. Excellent. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to move on to Hugo, Hugo Brady, who is the Senior Advisor at the International Centre for Migration and Policy Development over in Vienna. And before that, he was an advisor and speechwriter for Donald Tusk. Now, Donald Tusk gained a reputation for being an extremely effective and efficient uh, communicator in that time without taking all the credit yourself. What made him so good at that, effectively? What were his skills? Well, I can take very little of the credit, actually, because the, the vast majority of the impetus and the ideas and the energy always came from Tusk. Tusk was very much his own uh, editor of his own newspaper. So he very uh, tightly controlled uh, the messages that were going out and he performed his own analysis, which is always a great thing. Uh, he, he was capable of making a European analysis. Uh, I think he was effective because he was not afraid to upset people. Uh, I think in Brussels, Brussels is a very needy uh, construction. Sometimes it wants to, it wants so desperately to be liked. And as you know, from any in, an individual who's desperate to be liked, you know, they usually are not very well liked. So I would say Tusk had talent, uh, which is very rare. And I think we don't think enough about talent in Brussels. And I'm, I'm not being smart. Everybody, every politician has their, a different style of communication. There is no one style, but certainly, you know, I would like to be Cristiano Ronaldo, but that doesn't make me a footballer of his caliber. And Tusk certainly just had raw talent. Secondly, he had a lot of credibility because of his life story. Uh, from his beginnings in the Polish solidarity movement, he had suffered for his country to be a part of Europe, to be a part, to be a liberal democracy. He's actually a liberal more than a Christian Democrat, but he realized that liberals have a hard time getting elected. So he formed, he formed this uh, broad church organization to get the center in politics, which as you know, you must have to get elected. So people uh, found him very credible. Uh, and also, and this is another thing we underestimate, I think again in Brussels is just likability. Uh, people, I remember British Eurosceptics uh, saying on Twitter, I don't know if I'm going soft, but there's something about this guy I can't help liking. So he just had that kind of X factor. 
Uh, on top of that, he understood very well the need to punch through out of the bubble and down to, I say down, but it's probably up, uh, national level. And he even said once, you know, we have to think about a guy on the back of a tractor in the middle of a field listening to a crackly radio. You know, do are these words going to stay in his head uh, when, when we say them? So he, he had all of those things. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, over praising him, but he, in his own way, he was a genius. Uh, he thought a leader's job uh, is 90 percent uh, communication and 10 percent technical work. And Brussels often operates exactly the other way around. So I think he was a very necessary uh, corrective on that. And sometimes he had to defy the bubble in order to save it, you know, in, 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 in several crises, including the migration crisis and Brexit. Interesting. No, fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the panel, there is Luke Van Middelaar, who has a background as a, a former advisor to Herman Van Rompuy, as well as briefly Donald Tusk, and has written a series of excellent books on the EU's history and how it has developed. Um, I want, wanted to kick, up, kick off with one of the themes you mentioned in your latest one, uh, giving you a bit of a plug, Pandemonium. And this idea of the sort of emergence of the, the sort of common conversation within Europe. You had politicians talking to voters in different countries and a, the emergence of a sort of the, the much fabled and longed for sort of European demos. Now you, you argued that that sort of did come about this time. So my question is, is that a sort of temporary thing that only happens during a crisis or does it, will it actually stick around this time? Thank you, Duncan. Um, I think this, uh, pandemic was a very specific uh, crisis where indeed a public debate, a public sphere was uh, emerging in the sense that um, Italian voters directly appealed to, to German politicians, for instance, uh, uh, buying uh, ad space in the Frankfurt Allgemeine, Allgemeine Zeitung to, to make the case uh, for, for solidarity in, in that case. And there have been also earlier um, instances of, of a European public debate in that respect, so for instance, in, in the Euro crisis, which is uh, where uh, the man I worked mainly for um, had his, uh, his time in office, Herman van Rompuy. And maybe if you want me to say a few words about, about that experience uh, as well to, to kick it off, and then happy to, to uh, uh, expand further on the other things later. I think he, um, Van Rompuy was very well aware that he was uh, not a charismatic figure who you send out on, on television. But his job was very different for two reasons. Uh, one is the office he, um, he was uh, given or elected for was new, president of the European Council. And even many heads of state of government didn't want such a function to exist. So his first job was really to gain the confidence and respect of his peers, the other uh, heads of state of government. And he knew that the worst thing to do if you want to um, gain that trust is to communicate over their heads uh, to their own national publics. So he was deliberately reluctant in reaching out to a wider audience and he focused first on his peers, but that's more, of course, day-to-day -day contact diplomatic work. And then secondly, I would say, first two years at least, focused on precisely the Brussels bubble, on uh, think tanks, uh, uh, diplomats, those kind of networks of people who know Brussels, gaining credibility there, um, gaining a reputation which um, for, for crafting smart compromises, for um, being able to, um, to see the various sides of stories and therefore also in the really narrative battle of those Euro crisis days of North against South um, in particular to, to tell both sides that there were two sides to the, to the story. So more a didactic role, um, a little bit professoral if you want, which, which fit with the personality uh, he was uh, to, to build up the office and also to help uh, overcome that crisis to the extent it was also a, a, a clash of narratives, as I said. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for that. So we've seen sort of three quite different approaches of how, how to deal with this question. So we're going to speak to Hugo uh, in depth 
for a little bit now. Now, you mentioned that the, the sort of Tusk sort of secret source was basically being willing to have a fight. Why is that so sort of rare at an EU level? Why, why don't you see more of this? Why don't you see proper punch-ups, which you're meant to see in politics? I think that, uh, well, Tusk was very much a national politician when he came to Brussels. Uh, the, the, the informal rules that of the very nice town, very well-mannered, well-behaved town that we know as Brussels, uh, you know, that wasn't his style. And uh, he didn't see, uh, you know, he just worked to the rules of national politics and Polish politics, as, as, as you might know, is especially, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a cage fight. Uh, nothing is easy in Polish politics and everything is a fight and a row. So he took that. I would say that President Van Rompuy, his predecessor, was a master compromise broker for precisely for some of the reasons that Luke has just said. And I think that Tusk, uh, was less a chairman of the board and more so someone who was natural with setting an analysis, handing down orientations and leading, leading from the front. And both men, in my opinion, were exactly what the union needed at exactly that moment. So and uh, with Angela Merkel as the constant between the two of them, if Merkel was Muti, then I think of Tusk was kind of Vater, you know, uh, that he balanced out the other side, uh, the other side of things that were needed at times, including being a bit stern, not being very popular by setting down, saying the migration crisis simply couldn't go on that way. And what I particularly think brought out his talents was Brexit. And the reason why is because, because he was a guy used to dealing with uh, conflict, comfortable around it. Uh, Brexit gave him the one thing that the EU lacks sometimes in its public communication, which makes it almost invisible to ordinary people, which is conflict, which is an, an other. In, in a way, Brexit, almost, uh, I, I hope I'm not being uh, churlish when I say this, it, it, uh, it sort of saved the EU by giving it something to oppose. And uh, therefore it gave it shape and definition in the public's mind. And Tusk was, uh, just had such a field day, uh, as you well know, uh, Luke was talking about not going over the heads of voters, uh, but Tusk did that all the time uh, to, to Theresa May, uh, and later to Boris Johnson, and he he really reveled in it. And at one point, I I, I joked with him that he was more popular in Britain than in uh, Poland. And also, uh, I think we we were informally approached by the editor of GQ to see would they put Tusk on the front cover, which I thought was a pity. But uh, Tusk is also don't forget the first uh, EU leader to reach a million followers on Twitter, which is quite modest by Hollywood standards, but not bad at all from European uh, standards. So. He really took that format. His social media was also not such a thing in the uh, years previously, and Tusk really weaponized it for his own for his own purposes. So I think that uh, he, he, in in Europe we have to have the courage to name an other, because that's what gives people the the we we go on the popular the radar of the popular consciousness, uh, rather than you know the the kind of very nice progressive motherhood and apple pie uh, messaging that that. Brussels is traditionally most comfortable with, I think it bores people, even if they agree with it. Uh, I think that uh, there needs to be this sense of, after all, Europe is facing very real stakes in the world. But because Europe is such a values-based project, it's difficult for it to pick a fight. And also, you know, picking a fight as a, uh, or opposing an enemy that's already there. Uh, it doesn't have to be a country or a people, it can be something else. Uh, but two, just to, possibly because of his background, and he always knew exactly well what he was doing. Uh, he knew how to pick a fight and how to win it. Because, of course, picking a fight and losing it is very risky. And that's why politicians, you know, often avoid that. And a key and uh, Tusk was full of sympathy for that as well. I mean, a key thing on top of likability, credibility and talent, about 50 percent of the job is not making mistakes or not making yourself look foolish. Because that will also attract uh, the ire of the of the public. So it's a, politics is a really difficult job. Uh, po politicians are not popular people, I know. It's a totally unregulated profession. So we, it, you know, it's very hard to see, uh, you know, you can't pick brilliant politicians. They just arrive or they don't. And uh, I think that uh, Tusk had that talent and thank God he was there at the right time. And I think he's missed in, in Brussels, quite frankly. I mean, he's doing something arguably more important even now, but... Uh, these were, these were his, his key approaches. If you want, uh, it's good for the people listening today, there were one format that we tried to revolutionize uh, in the European Council, which was letters to leaders. And uh, they, they come out traditionally on the Tuesday or the Monday night before the summit. 
uh, before the European Council uh, summits, and Tusk really tried to tell the truth in those letters. So he cut out all the polytests and put in uh, you know, an unsparing analysis, which was often uh, criticized as too ap apocalyptic. I remember on one occasion uh, by the Germans, uh, but Tusk felt that he really had to get the message across that Europeans will either stand united in a world of Putin, Z, and uh, Trump at the time, or, or we'll fall separately. And he, I, it's one thing I noticed actually recently is that there's less and less talk in the European narrative about the importance of unity. That uh, maybe it's the pandemic, I don't know, but it's, it seems to have slipped down the agenda. But for us, it was an article of faith. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, he understood the need to tell uh, stories that people found credible. And um, people, he never bored people. And this is mm -hmm. something I think that Europe does all the time. And I say that with full knowledge of the fact that it's never easy for people in international institutions. They are automatically uh, suffering a handicap. Uh, in what they can say and in public visibility. I mean, how, how really well known are UN, uh, senior UN figures, for example? The EU is a more elaborate, a much more uh, integrated organization than the UN, I know. But uh, uh, the reality is that this is, a, this is something Europe has to get much better at, which is a cliche, but technocratic brilliance uh, or technocratic ability without the ability to effectively communicate politically is a 700 horsepower sports car with no keys in the ignition. And that was very much the, uh, because we were facing the so-called poly crisis, uh, you know, this was a very, very necessary thing uh, at the time that we were there. We were still suffering the end of the Euro crisis. We we're suffering a migration crisis, which because Europe is an openness project, most European leaders, uh, most people in Brussels were absolutely unequipped with the language necessary to handle that crisis. And uh, Tusk came along and offered the analysis that it's, it just can't go on that way. We can't be, in, we can't be okay with 10,000 people a day walking across the border. But nine people out of 10 in Brussels wanted to handle that crisis by facilitating it, by basically allowing the flow to continue and sharing out everyone around Europe, which would have just, well, it was logistically impossible. And also it would have guaranteed the continuation of the crisis. And Tusk had the courage, which is leadership after all, isn't it, uh, to stand up and say, listen, this can't continue. It has to stop. But no, it, it was literally impossible in the lexicon of European language up to that point in the European project to say the words not welcome. It was very hard. And uh, sometimes Tusk was stronger than he would have needed to be. But the, the pressure on the other side was just so great that, uh, that someone had to, to stand out and, and take a stance. Brexit, obviously, much easier because Brexit was such a strange act by the United Kingdom. Uh, what Tusk's priority there was, uh, was to try and uh, obviously be a, an effective uh, leader of the negotiation team for Europe. At the same time, and I think he was in a minority again, keeping the door wide open for Britain, should mm -hmm. it by any chance change its mind, uh, because he was always looked at things through the geostrategic lens, as well as, a, as well as being an effective communicator. I mean, he always had one eye on that. Let me just say one word, uh, because I, I've said a lot about he, he, was able to, he was able to communicate simply, but he was, he was also, uh, it's ta I'm talking like he's no longer on, on planet Earth, but anyway, uh, he was also a, a total intellectual snob. So he was very much in, in control of, of the, you know, he brought something to the table intellectually. And I think in his speeches and his statements, we, we, he really tried to use a, a plurality of European writers and thinkers. I mean, he quoted Hannah Arendt, James Joyce, Max Weber, Ivan Vazov, Denis de Rougemont, who's a, this uh, Swiss philosopher of federalism, Milan Kundera, uh, Sandro Morai, Stefan Zweig, and uh, Nishita Stanescu. And Sarah was talking about uh, the importance of speaking in different languages. Uh, Tusk, when he visited the Balkan countries, Bulgaria, Slovenia, Romania, uh, any country that had a presidency, the president of the European Council traditionally travels to that country at the opening of the presidency. Tusk would always address those audiences in their own language. Even Romanian, which is not a naturally Slavonic language, it's a Latin uh, based language. Uh, and he would put hours of preparation into learning if he needed to. Sometimes he was just able to speak. But that was the first time they'd ever heard an EU figure talk to them in their own language. 
And the, I, I used to get huge adulation on LinkedIn and Facebook, completely undeserved, by the way, uh, because it was all too, uh, about uh, that, the impact that this had on people. And, and in those speeches, which are well worth looking up, he always made a certain to remind the countries of all of the great things about them. Uh, you know, we would do a lot of research beforehand and he knew a lot anyway. And he would give them, he would boost up their self-confidence uh, as countries, because as you know, the Central and Eastern European countries are often very doubtful that they're seen as equals around the EU table. And if they have that perception, it's not always their fault. So Tusk was, he really worked on that. And also in the EU's diplomacy, he worked on it. And yeah, I have to agree with Sarah that this is super important. And he had a, he had a great line, which I loved, that Europe has too many Cassandras, politicians and intellectuals who are really good at saying we're doomed or we're facing all these challenges or Europe is in terminal decline. Uh, but he said too many Cassandras and too few Odysseuses, uh, too, few, too few smart, efficient leaders, practical to the extreme and ruthless where necessary. And I think it's an iron rule in politics that uh, strength attracts and weakness repels. You know, no matter how people think communication has changed uh, or not changed, that is a constant. And I think sometimes uh, Brussels gives out the message of self-loathing. Uh, also, there is this notion of the shame of Europe is a great, is a very big narrative in the international mm. uh, narratives, either from international organizations uh, lobbying Europe, for example, to let in uh, migrants or, or on another topic, uh, for colonialism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or as you know, my friend, in the Anglo-Saxon media, the, the shame of Europe, the impending collapse of Europe is, is a constant, you know, uh, sub-theme of many, many pieces. But Tusk came out and he said, I'm proud to be European. And I'm not proud to be European because we're better or worse than anyone else in the world. Mm. It's different. Again, he located the other. He distinguished us as a group in the world as a family, not better or worse than anyone else, but just different. Okay. And I think uh, this was very important. Excellent. I'd just like to bring in uh, Sarvan Boon here. So let's just uh, go back to uh, Spitz and Kandil uh, Sarah, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I want to talk about the reasons why it failed. So it one, Timmons, didn't, didn't quite win. And then two, um, the eventual winner didn't end up being uh, the president of the European Commission. So in both regards, it wasn't uh, a, a sort of brilliant day, day in the office. So what, why was that? How, how come it didn't quite work? Uh, I think many reasons. One of them, and I'm not I'm not trying to, to, from my perspective as a social democrat or a member of the PES party, but it started already by the EPP picking uh, a candidate that they, they actually didn't support. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm sure that if they wouldn't have chosen um, Manfred Weber, but a candidate that was actually supported by all of the EPP um, prime ministers in the council, uh, like Juncker uh, was at that time, uh, uh, that person would have been uh, the president of the commission. Um, so you, could, you can actually say that we had two rounds now of this, of two tryouts of the Spitzen uh, candidate system. The first one, um, it worked out. Uh, and the second one uh, didn't. We, I think we can have two or three sessions about that summer, uh, what happened, because there are many, many layers. But I think it starts there. Um, the second, yeah, well, no, basically, so the guy, uh, in, I mean, the rule still is that, or the rule, whatever, is that, uh, okay, they're proposed by the council, the European Parliament has to, and in, it is in a very clumsy, but mm, uh, positive, meaningful, with a good hard way, um, the most democratic process. Uh, it's lacking though, uh, pan-European uh, list still, so it's a bit strange 
that you can't you're you're traveling around as as if you're having a a, a U.S. style presidential uh, uh, election, but you can't you can only vote in the country where the guy is coming from. In this, uh, this uh, or the the, the woman, uh, be, but that's that's also another reason why it didn't work out. The liberals they they were for the Spitzen candidate system, but they didn't have a Spitzen candidate. And then after the, they had many, and then after the election, suddenly they did have a Spitzen candidate. So also that was messy, uh, which confused uh, um, uh, the process a lot. Um, but what at least what, what I, I can say from, from, from our campaign, what we did and which was actually quite successful, at least in a, in a few countries, is that we try to connect uh, the Spitzen candidate to the, to the member parties in the different, uh, in the several, in the different uh, European countries. And, and, it, and we try to strengthen each other uh, in, in it. For example, the SPD uh, at that time was very, 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 very unpopular. Um, and but Franz was quite a popular figure in Germany and quite well known already for many years. So um, in Germany, uh, for example, the youth USOS, uh, the youth uh, organization from SPD, they loved Franz like Bernie Sanders kind of style. So they were walking around not with T-shirts with SPD on it. They were walking around with. Van Stimmermans, and in every TV show and every debate, Van Stim we, they had to connect uh, the fact that if you like Van Stimmermans and you don't like Weber, please vote for SPD. Now they had a very dramatic uh, result, eleven percent or something. But later uh, research showed that they, without France campaigning in Germany, they would have ended up with six percent. So in a way, <laughs> it it worked. Um, and another country, which was the opposite, was Denmark. Uh, our social democratic prime minister there, she just said to us, never show up in this country. My voters, they hate Europe. They hate the European institution. They hate speech and candidate. So every time you show your face here, uh, I will go down in the poll. So don't come. Fine. We won't come. For the Netherlands, for the campaign in the Netherlands, actually the place where, where you could vote for him, we used the whole presidential trip uh, to make him, uh, you can vote for uh, Frans the winner. If you vote Frans, we win, we get the, we get the president. So what we did is we, we took TV cameras from the Netherlands, newspaper, whatever, to Spain, where Frans was with Pedro Sanchez on the stage, with Antonio Costa, with Stefan Leuven, with oh, and in Italy where um, the P PD was uh, doing quite well and everybody loved Franz there. So it was a kind of, uh, yeah, two-way street, both, uh, both sides. And, and indeed some, uh, so, some uh, countries said, uh, said stay away. Um, so in a way it's, it was, uh, and, and turnout it was higher uh, the, than 20, like the 70s. There was one turnout higher. It was in the 70s and turnout. So in a way, um, uh, I think it worked. But in the end, it yes. didn't work because one of the speeds, no, but no, none of the speeds and candidates became commission president. Right. And, yeah. Is so there is... Sorry. So in, terms, in terms of the sort of EU becoming a sort of normal parliamentary democracy then, how much of a step back was that? Because it seems like we, we don't have a mature European democracy if you have the Danish prime minister saying, do not campaign on European issues during this European elections. That feels quite an unhealthy situation to be in. How do we get out of that? Well, we can also uh, have a whole panel about the Danish, uh, the Danish situation. But <laughs> um, in the end, uh, in the end, also, I think we talked before also about uh, 
um, who are inspiring figures, uh, who are the Spitzen candidates uh, popular uh, uh, popular enough or uh, um, uh, famous uh, names or whatever, you will only get that if if it will be a direct presidential election. I mean, Macron, Merkel, famous people, they will never run uh, for president of Europe um, as long as the speech and candidate system is the way it is. Mm. Um, so, uh, and you can even see that, you can see that also in, in the States. Mm. Nobody, uh, they only start knowing the pe presidential candidates after the primaries, after the, uh, the time that you actually can directly vote for them. Yes. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, but there is, a, at least with, uh, with, our, uh, with our candidate, we did make an end to the faceless bureaucrats mm. uh, kind of situation that people think uh, or sometimes say they are. So yes. in a way, that's in a way that is progress. Yes. So European politics was at least slightly politicized, which is a healthy step. Yeah. I, I just so. like to I just like to bring in uh, Luke on, on that question about sort of leadership and the the type of leaders you get at an EU level. So they're often. So you, you mentioned Herman van Rompuy was a sort of uh, backstage figure, but not, not the most sort of charismatic man in Europe. Is, is that a, a feature or a bug of the EU institutions that you often end up with these types of figures at, at the top? And is it a problem? I think it's more a feature mm. than, a, than a bug. And, and um, um, to the extent that, well, of course, it depends on the job you're talking about. Huh? President of the Commission, has another role, another um, task in the system than the president of the European Council. Uh, president of the Commission is supposed to, to take initiatives, to have certain vision of the, view, of the future, um, whereas the president of the Council is supposed to be the person who finds unity and compromises among 27 leaders. So, so these are different political talents that are asked for. And, um, it's good if, if, if the protagonists keep that in mind. But even maybe briefly commenting on, on your discussion with Sar uh, mm -hmm. just now, even the president of the commission is not a president of Europe. And if, if we think that the Spitzenkandidat system will provide that, and if only it were better performed, uh, we would have uh, a president of Europe in the way we have a president of France or a chancellor of, of Germany, in my view, that is creating false expectations. Huh? The parliamentary features of the EU are one part of it. Clearly, there is this relationship between the, uh, the European Parliament and the Commission, but it's not the only story. Huh? Um, it's not the only um, line of political responsibility because precisely there is also the, uh, the European Council, the summits, a kind of what you could call presidential element in the system alongside the parliamentary one. And um, maybe I want to pick, of, pick up on, on uh, something you discussed also with Hugo, mm. or the point um, um, of that there are too many Cassandras in, uh, in Europe, and that very easily uh, in the EU you have this um, rhetoric of dramatization. Huh? Mm. We, and that is, that is a, a bug of the system. Uh, that is a feature and a bug, but it, the reason is that for all leaders, all national leaders, all national public opinions to agree on in times of crisis, when very far reaching uh, measures, new decisions have to be taken, um, in many cases, they can only be convinced to do so if uh, there is a real risk, if there is an existential risk, if well, like in the euro crisis, if the euro is at the brink of collapse or the migration crisis, if it's the end of Schengen or even the end of the EU, same with Brexit. And there always is an element of exaggeration there, I, I, I think. Huh? Well, so, of, 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 of exaggeration. Okay. So of, of really overplaying it, um, dramatizing the situation in order to 
make sure that all of them, uh, when we talk about summits, 27 national leaders all sign up to, 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 to certain conclusions. It is as if in the EU in normal times, um, you cannot take these very um, important uh, steps or, or, or radical drastic decisions without that rhetoric of dramatization. That, that is, is a weakness because of course it creates a lot of uh, uncertainty, uh, anxiety uh, among, the, among the public. Uh, it's not a great way of, uh, of communicating uh, your message if you really uh, have to say that the house is on fire before you can take action. And um, it's, it's hard to, to overcome because you see it happen each time. Same in the, in the pandemic. There it was Macron from France who, who spoke to the Financial Times around Easter 2020 uh, saying this is a historic a nightmare almost. It's like 1919 uh, and we shouldn't make the same mistake uh, as in Versailles, but we should rather do like in 1945. So that was dramatic uh, rhetoric, but also Macron did what I think EU leaders should do much, much more is bring in history, open up, um, open up a wider uh, time, a wider uh, space. And um, perhaps I can conclude with that. Um, it's it's another... on, 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 your, on your point about the crisis, sort of crisis mentality being a weakness, because that's the only time leaders sort of get their butts in gear and, and, and decide anything. Is that, is that always the case? Because you can make the argument that a lot of the sort of European inter uh, integration steps sort of taken sort of post-85 single market Maastricht uh, various treaty revisions every sort of four or five years. That was, in retrospect, in relatively calm waters compared to sort of 2012, 2015, and that sort of era. So isn't it the case that the EU can sort of move forward without crisis and that we've sort of just fallen onto this uh, crisis model just because there has been quite a few crises in the past few years? Well, I think that's perfectly true I think, for, the, for the internal market, for, for the single European Act 1985, where all leaders, uh, Margaret Thatcher included, and she was even pushing for it, saw the economic benefits for their industries, for the citizens of, of, of that project. So there was a push forward. But the euro uh, is a little bit different. Eh? The Maastricht Treaty was perhaps the most turbulent phase in European history since the Second World War. It was right after the Berlin Wall came down, the end of the Cold War, uh, the fear of German uh, unification. And it is under that really historic pressure that uh, Helmut Kohl, in a way, had to give up uh, the Deutschmark uh, in exchange for an economic, or sorry, for a, a European currency. So that, that, that was quite a dramatic situation in, uh, in its own right. And um, like more recent crises, and I presume we will have more of those uh, coming up, uh, uh, whatever they will be, huh? whether they are uh, known unknowns or unknown unknowns, but clearly uh, there will be uh, more crises in the years ahead. And um, so I just wanted to come in on, on, on one point. Do you want to take the mic? Yeah, just quickly, because I, I, I don't want Luke, um, to misunderstand me about this. I, I, I was talking about it in the, in the campaign, from a campaign perspective answer, because I agree with you that maybe in the end, the strongest uh, communicator in Europe is or should be Europe as a whole, uh, in the sense that I think you saw just briefly before the summer with both recovery package even though it took them a huge fight of a few days, but when when it the deal was done, and also when the deal was done with the Green Deal Fit for 55, and in a cynical way that came out during uh, when Spain was on and Greece were on fire and Germany had 2,000 people dying because of floods, and the recovery came, that everybody in Europe had the same message whether it were prime ministers, the commission, the council president, whatever. And I think that maybe was the strongest communi communi communicator in Europe, that basically the, they all took leadership by communicating in the same thing. And I think for citizens, that was the most important. And it didn't, doesn't really matter 
and it's it's the most important for Europe. It doesn't really matter who's saying it and in which title or whatever, as long as they communicate in the same way, because that actually helps. Excellent. Just so that's to... a good point. Uh, sorry, apologies. I'd just like to move over to uh, what, one of the questions we just had in the Q&A, which we've talked about the sort of slightly different working methods between Tusk and, and by Monpoy. Um, how would you describe the sort of Charles Michel working method? And that's mainly for Luke and Hugo, who both have experience of working closely with the European Council presidents. How would you how would you describe the Michel the Michel method? Let's call it that. Let's start with you, Luke. I'm going to throw you in. Well, it. yeah, maybe we, we, you should ask somebody who is who is closer to the to the Charles Michel uh, mm. team. I that's think an outsider. He he. Um, uh, I think he, he focuses a lot on, on, on communication uh, as well, uh, maybe following, uh, following uh, the lead of Tusk, but so far, uh, I would say not with the same uh, impact. Um, he sees, let me put it differently. Huh? We've seen, and, and Hugo was very clear on that, that political communication is really the encounter of a personality, a political leader, and a historic situation. Mm-hmm. And in a way, uh, ironically, or uh, Tusk was lucky that under his watch, the uh, migration and refugee crisis broke out, say for Brexit. He had, for instance, a little more difficulty in dealing with the Greek or the final eruption of the Greek crisis uh, of Syriza. Whereas Varumpai, on the other hand, was also lucky because as a trained economist, somebody whose first job was at the Belgian Central Bank, he felt perfectly at ease with all the number cracking of the Euro crisis and he understood, in fact, what was decided. Now, Charles Michel, situation he is facing or what he sometimes um, with a little bit of pathos calls our generation uh, has been facing is the pandemic and also the geopolitical situation in which the European Union finds itself. So Michel very much has taken up this uh, agenda, uh, word, the word included, of the strategic autonomy. But that is very tough place to communicate. Uh, hardcore foreign policy, uh, because there are many, many players, uh, including national leaders. Uh, there are many setbacks as well. So it, it is quite a, a challenge, I would say, he has, he has given himself. Uh, but he still has another uh, three years to, to see how far it can come. Um, and there, I think we should um, judge only at the end of somebody's uh, term, because both Tusk and, uh, and Van Rompuy uh, improved a lot, both uh, in their language and the way they communicated, and they, they really uh, brought different messages to uh, the public, I would say, at the end, or after a few years than, than at the start. Yes. And so I suppose related to that, there's this question about this, whether there's a, a leadership vacuum at the moment. There's going to be a big Angela Merkel-shaped hole. This is, this is to all of you. Who do you think is the person best placed to fill it in your points of view? Well, I, I can briefly say a few words if you want. Uh, I don't think it will be one person filling that gap. But what you could maybe see emerging is um, a number of, of, of leaders taking that up. Obviously, Macron first in line, but then again, he's also facing elections in France and all the others know that as well. Uh, but perhaps uh, between Emmanuel Macron, Mark Rutte from the Netherlands and Mario Draghi from, from Italy, um, the three of them in a way representing uh, a certain amount of seniority and differences of views, they, they can fill some of that gap, of course, in interaction with, with von der Leyen and, and Michel. And then there will be a new chancellor at some point. And, but that person will, from day one, bring the weight of being Bundeskanzler. Huh? So whoever that person is, be, uh, is going to be, uh, people in the room will listen. But he... It looks like he huh? he will not bring the the experience and the personal authority that that Angela Merkel has built up over the years, and as she has 
basically been the informal leader of, of, of Europe, mm. of the European Union for more than 10 years. How much Duncan, does, oh, sorry. Do you mind if I just say something quickly? Please. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's the pandemic has, has kind of muddied the picture on political leadership because a health crisis, I don't think any leader in the world has been particularly effective communicator yeah. during the pandemic, uh, not just in Europe. And also picking up with what Luke said, you know, if you had come at this moment in Tusk's first term as European Council president, a lot of people would have uh, been complaining and saying that, you know, he wasn't very good or he couldn't speak English very well and all of these, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, this kind of stuff. So it's too early in their mandates to tell uh, what type of, what their legacy, uh, it's a big word, but, or how they will be seen. And also, don't forget Angela Merkel for the first two, three years of her chancellorship was people loved to underestimate her and talk down to her. And maybe because she was a, a woman, I don't know, but that she was a lightweight. Uh, you know, she didn't. Uh, it took her time and several crises and not making mistakes, which I said is 50 percent of the job mm. that that uh, it took her time to accumulate the gravitas that she has now where everybody is, you know, has nothing but good things to say about her, basically. Apart from the economist report. <laughs> yeah, you, you I wanna, uh, and I want to underline what Luke is saying, and it's a bit what I meant uh, in, in my previous uh, uh, comment. Uh, if you have Draghi, Rutte, uh, and Macron, uh, maybe Antonio Costa or Pedro Sanchez or one of them together, uh, finding compromise on policy politics and communication, then that's basically the new way forward for the European uh, Union in a way. Um, and and in, indeed, next to that, though, I mean, I've seen so many politicians that before you don't, the guy that, or the woman doesn't look like a, a prime minister or a minister. And the, the, literally the minute they, they put on that coat, they become it. So indeed, the, the new chancellor will not uh, have the experience, uh, experience and gravitas from the start. But especially if you talk about Olaf Scholz, I mean, he's been there for a while anyhow. Uh, and, and if once he puts on a code like that, he becomes it. So I don't, I don't, I, I wouldn't underestimate that um, either, I, I think. So is it the case that people are sort of overstating the, the potential post-Merkel vacuum that effectively there'll be a new chancellor and that they will have the same impact that Angela Merkel had, but it won't actually be that noticeable? And in that sense, perhaps individual leadership doesn't actually matter that much. It's so much more structural than that. And he's a big one. I mean, I know I've met the guy uh, many times. He, he, he is a bit of a Merkel. Mm. But there also, be, yeah, sorry, Luke, go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, there also is a period of transition. Huh? So there will be a period, which in a way has started now, where Merkel is German Chancellor, but she has no longer electoral uh, mandate, and there is no new Chancellor yet. So that's the only period I think about which you could you could speak of a, a kind of power vacuum uh, mm. to the extent that. Um, Merkel cannot sway her, her peers or the leaders the way uh, she could until before the summer. In a way, you could already see how that authority of hers was unraveling in, uh, ahead of the elections. So for instance, well, the, the June European Council, for those who, who followed this very closely, uh, there was a bit of a, of a, of a story about the Franco-German initiative vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And, there's a lot to say about it, but one reason it fell through in my view is that Merkel simply doesn't, didn't have the authority around mm -hmm. the table um, already two months before the elections, uh, let alone now. And it also depends, I think, on the subject. I mean, if, if COP20, uh, COP26 will be a success and the negotiators are Kerry, Timmermans and the Chinese, then at that, at that moment, one of the leading faces will be Van Stimmermont just because he is the climate negotiator for the continent. I mean, it also, and there will be many more examples, but this is uh, quite a big one uh, for the next uh, weeks, months uh, to come. 
That's a perfect jumping off point for France Two Moons 2024 then maybe. Don't forget, uh, by the way, that people don't like the German Chancellor to be too charismatic. Sorry, Hugo. Just sorry to say, uh, sorry to cut across you, sir. Uh, people don't like the German Chancellor inside or outside Germany to be too charismatic. Uh, so the idea that uh, the Germans are not comfortable with uh, a Chancellor that's too uh, outgoing. So I think in this sense, it's a managerial Chancellor, uh, including for Europe, is often a great uh, uh, comfort both to Germans and uh, to other people in Europe. So the French, it's the French presidential election that's critical. And I have to say, I get it, I'm getting a bit worried a little bit about that. You have a little bit of Anglo-Saxon pessimism in you. Well, <clears throat> I, uh, I just see that I think that for me, uh, maybe I'm obsessed because I've moved on to an, uh, a job that deals with migration all the time. It was always strange to me that uh, uh, during Macron's wonderful election, uh, that Europe was actually in the middle of a migration crisis at the time, and yet it wasn't at all an issue that the far right in France was able to mobilize. And now it seems to be more and more an issue for some reason when we don't have a migration crisis uh, for, domestic, for domestic reasons. So I think that this is something to watch, unfortunately. Okay. So uh, this one element I'd like to draw out, um, it's specifically on sort of how European councils work. It's a very individual environment. It's a very sort of intimate environment. How much does, can one sort of individual politician play in that room? How much can they actually shape it? Or are they sort of bound by whether they represent a Luxembourg or an Italy or a Germany? How do, what's the sort of ratio between individual impact and structural impact that you can have? Well, I think that um, leaders from smaller member states, some of them could be very effective, provided they, they knew their stuff, they were uh, funny. I mean, Jean-Claude Juncker, don't forget, before he was commission president, he was for 19 years or something like that, prime minister of Luxembourg, mm. uh, which, is, which is not a massive state. But he was very influential at the European Council, crafting compromises, uh, etc. But there's also sometimes the, the power, the sheer power of rhetoric. And here I remember Sarkozy, he was, he was very good. He was, I mean, he was trained as a, 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 as a lawyer. There were, there were moments, for instance, during the, the uh, Arab Spring and the way the European Union should respond to that 20, 2010, 2011, where he would sway the room with one intervention, right? where you could just feel that the mood uh, had had changed be, because of certain uh, charismatic uh, presence or or, or the, the way he, uh, he he spoke. So so personalities at that level of, of leaders, I would say, matter even more or much more maybe than at um, at level of of ministerial level or let alone at, at, at more diplomatic technocratic level. It, it becomes really uh, an interaction between alpha male, alpha female uh, political animals and um, with all their uh, well, talents, uh, as you pointed out, also weaknesses, etc. So that, that can sometimes be a little bit unpredictable, which is also, Duncan, why you as members of the press uh, like it, because there are stories coming out of, that, uh, of those uh, encounters. Perhaps one other word, if I may, on, on mm -hmm on the Franco-German relationship and the kind of expectations we have, it seems almost a given um, now that when we talk about who narrates Europe, huh, that the French are supposed to, to come up with ideas, initiatives, uh, drive the whole thing forward, uh, Macron style, uh, Sorbonne speech. Whereas we ask of the German chancellors and Merkel Schultz will both play that role to be pragmatic, to have no visions uh, at all, uh, etc. But I'm, I'm starting to wonder whether that is such a sound um, distribution of, of labor between Paris and Berlin. Because if it's, if it's each and every time France, which has to uh, drive forward, uh, at some point in time, it starts uh, to become irritating. Not for me. Uh, I mean, I, I love the French, I, I, I'm, I'm at ease in French, but I noticed for many other member states as well, it's, uh, 
it's again uh, a Paris idea. And it would be good to have more balance there in the narrating, in the storytelling, in the, uh, in the European communication between uh, Paris and, and Berlin. And if also the next chancellor would take up some of that task of um, setting an, an, an agenda rather than, than only uh, shopkeeping and, and uh, nine saying. It's an inherent problem, well, it, it, not, not inherent, but it does seem to be a problem that the other big countries, Spain, Italy, and Poland, uh, seem to be much less influential in these sorts of debates, that the sort of Franco-German engine does sort of, yes, it's always going to be the most important because it's the two most powerful countries in the bloc, but is it also a problem that there are just other big countries who just simply punch well below their weight? And again, how much of that is just down to sort of individual leadership and not being a sort of wily Juncker or a charismatic Sarkozy and able to dominate the room? And how much of it is just, I don't know, a structural problem in those countries that enable them to not properly perform at an EU level? I think that uh, self-image has a lot to do with it. Um, I think, uh, for example, I, I live in Vienna now, and one of the strange things about Austria is that it stands alone in Europe. It has no allies uh, uh, because of its self-image as a Two self images as a bridge between East and West, which makes it neutral, and also as the seat of a former empire of 80 million people. Uh, the population of the country today is, is, is nearer 10 million. So I think it's a self image, is one. I also note that larger countries sit uncomfortably around the table, a bit like the United States and the UN. Uh, Merkel was very good at handling that because she wore her power lightly. Uh, she also didn't need to dominate discussions, and she waited until the very end to land her, to land her killer blows if they were if they had to be landed. Um, it's true, Spain has traditionally uh, underperformed. Poland, when it has a government that's that is negative towards the EU, has underperformed. Uh, Italy is a very interesting case study because it went from being a Euro enthusiastic country with the great hope for the future. Uh, seeing Europe as the solution, long-term solution to all its problems, uh, as things were getting steadily worse in the country, uh, to, a, to now a kind of Eurosceptic light uh, country, although Italy will never leave the EU. Um, so, I mean, that's a, they're, in, they're all interesting thermometers, but as we were saying uh, before, personality, the EU is a, is a really, I think you wrote a column, Duncan, that, that talked about the, the end of the golden age of the small country, in the EU, because for a long time, the EU has been a paradise for small countries, allowing them to project far more than they would have done in an otherwise realist system. And uh, personality in the room allows that to be amplified even more. And uh, as I said, with the, we were, when we were talking about political communication, that it's about uh, talent, credibility and likability, uh, those things also play inside the European Council very much. Uh, I, I'm not going to name uh, names, but for example, there are certain there were certain leaders who would treat other the, treat the room to long lectures, uh, and uh, maybe they had been other other capacities in the EU before, and they thought that the rules of the European Council were the same as other bits of the EU, but they're very much not. Uh, and you would lose you, you, in one meeting, you could lose a lot of your credibility that you would not get back. You would not be listened to in the same seriousness. Um, and crying wolf was especially looked down on as you know, you know, in an ill it was not looked down on uh, was not looked at well, and also there was a great amount of silent respect in the room for anyone who could deliver their own electorate. In that sense, the European Council is very democratic. Uh, there's a person who is strong with their own uh, in their own country, even if they're not a, let's say, everyone's favorite cup of tea, carries a great amount of credibility around the table. Domestic strength equals European strength. And so if you have a country like Italy, where it's, it's an inherently fragile government, whatever government you're head of, yes. you're going to have a weak voice in Brussels. It's as simple as that. As Renzi, as Renzi was heading towards his referendum on the Italian Senate, you know, power just drained away from him. Uh, and he'd already squandered a lot anyway. Uh, he annoyed the leaders by haranguing them. And at one stage, uh, actually screamed at uh, the president of Lithuania. So... So indeed, there are these great stories uh, from the European Council of high drama, and, and Luke will know this very well. When when we when you're walking into the room, you see a heart attack crew just beside the room, 
And I remember looking at that and going, oh, my God, is that because of the stress uh, and the strain of, of the Greek bailouts and all the various crises? But of course, it's just being prudent. There are there were 28 uh, prime ministers in the room. Uh, so we had to. No, I, I, I like that story about uh, about Renzi, Duncan, if I may follow up on what mm. she was said. Because she was now talking here about the end of, of Renzi, but I remember the beginning, and it was also very, very uh, revealing. Because Renzi came to power basically after uh, after a coup, uh, he, he 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 killed politically at least Enrico Letta. Yeah. Letta so he yeah, did yeah. not win an election; he just was a party coup, and that's why the other uh, leaders didn't respect him. At, in 2013, I think it was, because there was no electoral mandate he had. And then he did win a year later the European elections in Italy uh, with, uh, with the Democratic Party. And then Renzi, all of a sudden, he was, he was completely, uh, well, booing and very proud and, and asking for part of the spoils for Italy, basically, in the job carousel back in 2014, which is, uh, by the way, why Federica Mogherini ended up as, as high representative, because Renzi, he, he was going like, we are the second biggest party in Europe, only after the CDU of, uh, of Angela. So we need something. And that time around, they, uh, they gave him what he wanted in, in the end, because of his uh, electoral legitimacy. So it's really, I fully agree with what Hugo said. It's, I think it's underestimated outside the room, but there is a, a respect of, again, political animals who are able of winning an election. Uh, in their country of delivering uh, their voters, their, their, their parliaments. And if I, uh, I, will, I will stop there, but it may also be, I'm throwing this in as a hypothesis, one reason why they have protected Viktor Orban. You're so right, Viktor Orban. As That's somebody right. who was able to win elections. Uh, well, you, you can have some questions, but on the other hand, Hungary okay. is, not, is not Belarus. Uh, so um, in terms of how these elections are won. And, and wow. part of that um, uh, even shines on somebody like, like, like Orban. But if I, can, uh, if I can come in on this, I think um, we also shouldn't underestimate that if Olaf Scholz indeed becomes chancellor um, of Germany, I think the power balance in all the institutions will change a bit towards the social democrats in this uh, uh, in this example um, because uh, a lot uh, also in the parliament was dominated by the cdu and uh, now um, i think the s d group will feel a little bit more stronger and even the within the spd group uh, the germans of course had a bad um, a bad result at the European elections, but now I noticed already they have they have a different attitude already towards the Spanish. Um, so so I think there will be uh, maybe a bit of a power shift also uh, in that sense uh, that we will discover in 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 what way if it's uh, in a positive way or in a nasty way or whatever, but. Uh, it will have some influence. It's going to be absolutely fascinating, the, the end of centre-right Europe and you know, a new Europe being born. Well, that's all the time we have time for today. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. Um, thank you to you all. And I'm afraid that's it. So thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.